Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'm going to bring us out of the early American Republic uh, and talk about another republic from long ago, however. Um, on Juneteenth represents a departure for me. I write about other people's families. I know the family trees of Jeffersons and Hemingses and Randolphs and all of those people, and I've devoted my career to talking about them. My editor, Bob Weil, has always wanted me to do a book about Texas, however, my home state. And he wanted me to do a big book about Texas for a big state. <laughs> and I might yet do that. But I did an essay for The New Yorker about Juneteenth, the holiday Juneteenth, June 19, 1865 when Gordon Granger comes to Galveston, Texas and announces that slavery is over in Texas. And I did an essay that talked about what it was like to grow up celebrating that holiday, which was not yet a national holiday, but is a holiday that has been celebrated in Texas every year since June 19, 1865. And even before he saw that essay, Bob raised the question of Texas a Texas history with me again. And I decided that I should do a book, but we would do a small book. And it would be not a conventional straight history, but it would be a book that would be a combination of a history, but also a memoir. I decided to tell the story of Texas through my family history. I've been in the Northeast now for many years, I left Texas to come up to Dartmouth for college and then went to Harvard Law School and then moved to New York and I've stayed on the East Coast all that time. And one of the experiences that I had, or I've had it many times, is people asking me to explain Texas to them. <laughs> What's up with Texas? I mean, I think Texas and Florida are the two states that people <laughs> wonder about. And I thought that this was an opportunity to do two things, to talk about my family history, but also to talk about it through the history of Texas. And this was during, I should say, it coincided with the pandemic. Harvard had closed and we were doing things virtually. And then we went into the summer and I was in New York. As you all remember, New York was sort of ground zero for the pandemic there in Manhattan. And we spent most of our time in the apartment, occasionally going out to Central Park for a walk and then coming back to the apartment. And I began to think about my parents who are no longer living, you know, what they would have made of this moment when the entire world was being held hostage, pretty much, by this virus. And I thought of them and I began to miss them. That was another thing, another impetus for writing the book. I wanted to sort of relive our time together to make me closer to them, to bring them back in a way. So I set out to write this small book that would talk about Texas, but talk about my family as well. One of the reasons I think people are puzzled by Texas is that it has an image, and it has an image that's very in the minds of people all over the world, actually. I did a language study program when I was in college in France, and what they knew about Texas was cowboys. They think about cowboys when you think of Texas. And I say in the book that Texas is a white man. It has been constructed as a white man. And what does it mean to be a place where people who are not white men are living? I'm a Texan, but that's but I'm not white and I'm not male. So what did it mean for many people like me over the years? Women, black people, Hispanic people, it's portrayed as a white man who is involved in the cattle industry, cowboys or rancher. The other image that might come to mind would be the oil man. And I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Giant. You know the movie Giant, and it tells a history of Texas. It's sort of like a, the story, the origin story, where once upon a time, 
there were cowboys and ranchers who ruled the land. And then they found oil. And the cowboys and the oil men and the ranchers hated each other until they found oil on the land of the ranchers, and then they became friends. They became as one. And that's the sort of arc of Texas history. But what's left out of that is another person, and that would be the plantation owner. Texas is a white man, but he's also, Texas is also West Texas. It's not Eastern Texas, where I grew up, which is the South. And I don't think many people think about Texas as a part of the South. And if you don't think of Texas as a part of the South, you don't think about slavery. And if you don't think about slavery, you don't think about an African-American presence in that place and what that meant for reforming the history and the attitudes and the thought processes of people who live in Texas. So what I wanted to do was to bring that back and to explain to people that a lot of the things that are going on today in Texas, a lot of the racial problems, problems of voter suppression, problems of banning books, the fight over what can be taught in schools, grows out of shame, guilt, concern, whatever, about the portrayal of Texas history, of things that actually happened in the past. So it's not like, there's not a question of people making stuff up. The Republic of Texas, in its constitution, prohibits people of African descent from coming and becoming citizens in the state. It protected slavery. It wanted to be clear that it was set up to protect slavery. One of the reasons there was such opposition to bringing, eventually bringing Texas into the Union was that it was started as a slave state, a slaveholder's republic is what it was called. And that's just in the books, you know? How can you teach Texas history or about the Republic of Texas if you don't read the Constitution, which explicitly promotes slavery and explicitly promotes white supremacy? So this whole discomfort with this story is what is driving a lot the bulk, the bulk of what is happening in Texas at this time period. Now, this relates to my family because my family on my mother's side and my father's side have been in Texas for many, many generations. On my mother's side, I can trace people back, someone back to the 1820s in Texas. This is before Texas is a republic, but certainly before it's a state. It's part of Mexico, and he was there. My father's side of the family, would be, I think 1850s as far back as I'm able to go with this. But they were brought to Texas on both sides from places like Mississippi, from Georgia, and Alabama were the three origin stories for my family. But they end in Texas. They come to Texas into the 19th century, early into the 19th, mid-19th mid century is what we're talking about here. So I feel that I have the bona fides to talk about the history of my family through that time period. So I began the book talking about Texas before it becomes a part of the United States, while it is still a part of, claimed by Spanish conquistadors essentially, with a man named Esteban who is in Texas in the 1520s. We th uh, the other things, people think of an origin story for African Americans as 1619 in Virginia. But black people are in Texas and in Florida in the 1500s. And when we took Texas history, which we take twice, in the fourth grade and in the seventh grade, and you could take it again in high school. I've had three years of Texas history, K through 12. We talked about Esteban, and we talked about the Spanish, but just in a small part. They were here, and then they're gone. The English won the contest for North America, and we speak English, and it's treated as if those people have no connection to us. And the point that I make in the book is that 
just because they spoke Spanish <laughs> doesn't mean that they had no connection to the people, the black people in Texas who were there later on, because they shared the status of enslavement, and they were also operating under a system of white supremacy that wasn't just an English thing, it was in, with the Spanish and the French as well. So they had a point of commonality because of the, the construction of an idea of race. So I, wanted, I talk about the Spanish influence in Texas and how that shaped Texas's history. Then I talk about my own personal experience. This is very difficult because, was difficult for me because, you know, I've always wanted to be a writer. Growing up, I thought that that's what I would be. I thought I would be a novelist. My hero was James Baldwin, and I would write short stories and novels and screenplays and live in Paris and do those kinds of things <laughs> that writers do. <laughs> but I don't have the capacity, really, to talk <laughs> too openly about myself and about my family. It's not about hiding anything. It's just a sense of privacy about it. And memoir today can be tell-all <laughs> in a fashion. So I had to find some way to balance my normal reticence with the idea of telling the story as frankly and openly as possible. And what I hit upon is I talk about my mother and my father. I give their names. I don't, I talk about my grandparents and other family members. I don't give their names. So as not to make them the center of attention in a way, but they're there, but it's not that personal. So I established a voice and a way of presenting things that's open, but as my co-author Peter Onuf said, it's open, but it's open in a Net Gordon Reed kind of way, which means that it's not too open. But I think it's enough <laughs> to make the points that I want to make about Texas history, which has to be the focus of the book. And so then I talk about myself as a child integrating our town schools when I was six years old, uh, a sort of Ruby Bridges type situation without the federal marshals escorting me. And that it's a Texas town, and I talk about the fact that my integrating that schools was definitely related to all of the history that went before. After the end of slavery, Granger makes this announcement, slavery ends, and black people embark upon, black Texans embark upon another struggle. And eventually it's the struggle against Jim Crow that my parents, when they chose to send me to this school, made me a part of that particular battle. And I talk about that. Then I talk about Native Americans in Texas. I grew up in a world where I looked at television shows and Native American people were portrayed as if they had disappeared totally. They were once here and they're people of the past. The title, people of the past, you know, people of the present, to sort of say they're still here <laughs> and they're a part of all of this. Reckon with, I reckon with the Alamo. I grew up thinking that you were supposed to remember the Alamo. Uh, but what you didn't remember about the Alamo is that Davy Crockett, William Barrett Travis, uh, Jim Bowie, those people were slave owners. And the Texians, as they were called, were fighting to maintain, as I said, the Republic of Texas, a Republic of Texas, or to create a Republic of Texas that promoted slavery. So what does that mean for a black person that you're supposed to have this notion, or black person or white people who are against slavery, you know? to have this image of this place as heroic, but at the same time, a place where men are fighting to preserve a system that uh, kept black people in bondage. And I end talking about Juneteenth itself and the aftermath of that, how, how it was a time of jubilee and struggle, but it was also a time when there was when there was hope that things would get better. I, one of the most poignant things that I discovered 
as I was doing my research in the sort of limited way that I was able to do this, that's the great thing about doing a memoir as well. My memories are my memories. I don't need footnotes for those. <laughs> but there are points, being the inveterate you know, <laughs> note uh, uh, archivist that I am, I did look back for things, look for things to sort of corroborate what I was saying. And one of the most poignant things that I found doing this was my great-great-grandfather's name on a voter list in 1867. And I knew, it, it, made, it was a source of pride for me, but it was also a, a source of, of anger and sadness because I knew what was going to happen. At the end of Reconstruction, this would all be over. A person who had been born as a chattel, treated as a chattel, wanted to participate in the government of his country, and that would be taken away until we come up to 1965, around the time that I'm integrating Anderson Elementary School. So I end the book with that discussion, and I often tell people that I think what I've learned in doing this is that anyone in this room could tell the story of America through your family. Following what happened to your grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, um, it's nothing special about what happened to my family. Different story, different side, but the similar a similar connection to the march of history. And so I've learned a lot by doing this. I don't know if I'll do it again, anything like this again, but it was an edifying and an inspiring situation for me to be able to make that kind of connection to history when I've spent most of my time writing about other people's history and other people's march through history. So thank you. <laughs>